I'm not going to talk about the CFC or CFC Media Lab or what I'm doing. Instead, I'm really going to try to share with you how I started to think about this notion of, okay, well, you're a next generation storyteller, Anna, what's, your, what's in your toolkit? So I had to figure out, well, how do I start to think about what are the things that I'm using without necessarily being prescriptive about very specific tools? Because there's actually quite a number of tools out there. And it's never a good idea to take a top-down approach telling people what they should use, but instead really kind of um, let them discover the kinds of tools that they need based on a series of constraints that we now find ourselves in in this new disrupted entertainment space. Okay, So as a result of that, I'm trying to figure out how to conceptualize that. And I thought a way to begin is to think about maybe another industry. So in this case, um, it's the circus. Uh, this is Cirque du Soleil, as you know. And if you think about Cirque du Soleil, uh, they did something quite phenomenal um, in their industry, which is really to rethink it or to reimagine it differently. Now, this particular framing of how they reimagined re it is taken from a book called The Blue Ocean Strategy by Kim and Ma Maborn. I don't know how many of you guys know that book. Okay, so it's a business book. So they're really looking at um, how you might try to disrupt the, the space that you're in um, and become a winner. I mean, it's a business book, so they talk about winners and, and, and becoming economic successes. In the case of uh, Cirque du Soleil, uh, they were able to analyze the stuff that they did and looked at the stuff that they eliminated from circusness or the essential qualities of circusness to the stuff they reduced about circusness or what that was like and what they ended up creating in terms of um, and raising in terms of, uh, uh, of providing that essential um, elements of the circus. So what they eliminated were things like animal shows and star performers and things like that because that didn't really create um, it, those weren't the things that made a circus a circus. It was around mystery and um, fun, etc. So Kim and Marbon then sort of took what they learned from Cirque du Soleil and then reduced it into a set of principles around how you might win in, an, in, a, in this new kind of environment. So in the case of content, we're really talking about you know, how do we create this uncontested market space? How do, we, how do we compete with other people who are competing for attention? In our case, it may not actually be other content creators, but it might just be people who are competing for eyeballs or attention, right? Um, how do we ad uh, address this, uh, you know, um, a, new, a new demand because that seems to be a way for us to, to be able to capture attention? And then, unfortunately, even though we are talking about public media and cultural content, um, you know, the economics still c come into play no matter what, right? So how do we do that where the trade-off isn't necessarily by doing it, by, by doing it for very expensive things? So, I started to think about how then do we create this whole new market space through the notion of cost, through differentiation. So what's your, what's your unique value proposition and low cost? So um, in, our, in the case of uh, Blue Ocean Strategy, they call this value innovation. And so today, what I thought I'd talk about was how we could pursue value innovation in the content industry. Now this is something that's not necessarily a, um, a finite number of things, so I just picked a few kind of potential strategies around this value innovation. And then within those strategies, I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, what are some of the tools to make that happen, okay? So let's begin. So the first one has to do with this notion of value innovation by finding all the dogs and telling them you're a dog. So what this means is that, uh, you know, I started in this space in 1993. And um, I was just fresh out of school, and I started working for Don Tapscott. I don't know if, he, if you guys know of him. But he, uh, he did this massive study called um, Networked Interactive Multimedia and its effect on a variety of industry sectors. And he had this speech that he would charge like $10,000 or $20,000 an hour. And he always had the same comic. And it would be this New Yorker comic that says, you know, what's cool about the internet is that nobody knows you're a dog. So at the, in the beginning, the internet was awesome because it was a leveler, you know, there was, it was not sexist, it was not racist, it was not this. But, um, and, and, you could, and particularly, you didn't need to, uh, you could kind of talk about anything. 
Now what's happening is in fact it's terribly important to tell people who you are because what the internet has done is really created these super niche markets and allow you to find those specific markets that, that actually understand who you are and understand your message. It's never been more apparent than on YouTube. So the rise of YouTube is really the rise of this, uh, of this very, very particular voices. So Wong Fu Productions is a, a, is a channel in LA. Um, these are three Asian guys who decided, we don't see any Asian stuff on television and on radio. We're going to create our own Asian American stuff. Um, and uh, I think they're subscribed. I mean, this is an old slide that I pulled out. But you know, they're, they've got over a million subscribers now, and they make short films, et cetera. You've got you know, uh, Kingsley Bitch, which is this. Uh, vloggers are obviously uh, also very particular types of voices because they speak to you directly. So there's that, there's that uh, immediate niche connection or, or point of view connection that gets created. Plus, there's also this invitation to be part of that conversation. As you can see from the leave your comment, uh, your vote in the comment section. Ace, and it's not just for um, uh, sophomoric content. It's obviously, it's also being used for very specific types of niche content that we may not think people want, but actually do want, like the ASAP science. And you guys obviously um, uh, worked with them during the Olympics. So I think for, in terms of what we need to do uh, for this particular you know, uh, value innovation, there are two toolkits there are two tools or items in my toolkit that I need to now really pay attention to. The first item are audience finders because um, you know it's really important that we know who we're. If we want to create these highly um, uh, specific content that will reach a particular um, point of uh, audience with a particular point of view, we need to know where those, those audiences are, and we need to know where they hang. There are many different ecosystems online. Um, you know, the Facebookers are different from the Pinteresters, are different from the uh, Twitterers, are etc. So uh, you really need to understand where they are. And so one of the tools that I think might be quite interesting, and this is something that we um, started to accelerate in our digital entertainment accelerator is called Alert TV. So this is a Canadian company. And, um, it, and the person who started it is uh, Moira Roger, who came from broadcast and was actually a documentary producer. And so she created this company because she needed to help um, other broadcasters and producers figure out how to target their multi-platform strategies in the right places online. So her first set of products was actually sort of almost um, uh, a learning environment where uh, the system would help you, will help guide you to finding places online. Uh, to finding your audiences um, online and where you should go and where you should target. And then it generates almost a strategic report on what that is. She's since um, created a whole new other set of product uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, deliverables that will further automate this, this audience finding process. Okay? So that's just one, but there's a bunch of those things. But I think audience finders are tools that we now have to start to understand and really uh, look at. Um, the, second, the second tool in my toolkit that I think is critical are point of view generators. Okay? So if we believe that the internet is now a space where um, you, know, you really need to know who you are, what your message is, and target those people who are interested in listening to those messages, then figuring out how then do we create point of view more easily is going to be critical. Now the good news for radio is that you guys are actually the winners in this space because you un you've, you've understood what it meant to create companion media. You know, So one of the essential qualities of lit radio is that it's intimate, it's about companionship, it's about um, that, per that specific voice, it's about um, that specific personality, um, and in a way, uh, you could say, well, we're getting disrupted by Spotify and Pandora and all those kinds of music aggregators. Actually, you're not, because the quality, because those things don't have these personalities. They don't actually allow for that. However, you can't just rest on your laurels and go, okay, well, we know how to cultivate personalities and therefore we're winning in the space because what's happening is perhaps those personalities need to be cultivated 
across multiple media and not just audio, no matter how powerful audio is. So some of the things that you might want to consider in terms of um, point of view generators are things like uh, actually, you know, infographics. I know it's kind of cheesy and stuff to talk about infographics, but the reality is they do really, really well. Um, but they're very difficult to make. So, so there's a bunch of new startups out there that are making the creation of these contextual information spaces because that's what it is. Infographics allow you to craft a point of view visually, right? So they're context makers um, uh, more easily. So visual.ly or visually is a, is a place that has essentially um, minimized the amount of money you might spend on creating infographics by developing a community of graphic designers who, can, who, you, who they can tap into to create these infographics much more cheaply for you. So they're kind of like the Behance network just specifically related to visual information. But they also have um, a number of other uh, products uh, uh, associated that, 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 that are more automated. Um, another one is called Vengage, and this is actually a, um, a company out of Toronto. Um, and for and Vengage itself lets you create your own infographics, so it's not about uh, curating designers to do that for you, but allows you to create your own. Um, in this case, it's I think you know, it the, the 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 it's still a pro and con, right? Like obviously, people who there's a craft and an art to data analysis and data um, visualization, and so the people who know how to do that well probably would fare better than just the automated systems. However, if you want to do something super quick, you know, and you know that it's not, doesn't require a lot of analysis, and you're a, you're a radio personality, and you have your own website, and you, you're dealing with very specific things, like for example, the spread of the Ebola disease out there, you know, you might just want to pick up, go to Vengage, do a quick infographic, post it to your Twitter feed, or post it onto your website, and then that becomes part of the viral content that you're, or you can't say viral because you don't know if it's going to go viral, but that becomes part of the shareable content that would be attached to your particular point of view. And so you're expanding your, the, your point of view across a variety of media, and there are now tools that help you do that. Another kind of um, uh, tool that is kind of interesting is Dippity. You know, again, another context creation tool is the timeline. So um, for news, for you know, unpacking very complex events, a timeline is a really good idea. But you know, we are, we're not all New York Times. We're not all going to create Snowfall. And um, even the even the tools that created Snowfall kind of failed. Um, I forget what it was called. I don't know if anyone Parallax. remembered what it was called. Sorry. Parallax. Yeah. No. Well, the, it, it was called Scroll IT actually, or so, so it's it uses Parallax, but Scroll IT was a was another kind of technology that they used to see whether they could encourage more people to create these scrollable, um, in, uh, you know, visual storytelling um, experiences like Snowfall. But, um, but I don't think you need to go all fancy. Like, I think there are ways to create this stuff where um, it's about the content. And so if you can, so that's what is amazing about this particular value innovation is that it's not about how expensive and fancy you make something, but it's about if you can generate a point of view that is authentic, that is real, that is unheard of, that is, that is lacking, um, that's, that's attached to the personality that you're trying to mine in the case of radio, then you could, I think people will will want to see this stuff, you know? So it's not just, it, you know, this is not very fancy at all, but it, it works, you know? Um, now, if you're totally into super duper, like not all, some of you are maybe more text and visual uh, by nature, but while as others, and I don't know if CBC is, is becoming like this, are maybe much more numer uh, numerate and um, coders by nature, you know? So if you're that type of person, then this particular tool, um, Gephi, I think that's how you pronounce it, is quite interesting. They call themselves the Photoshop of data visualization. So um, I'm just going to play this for you because I think it's pretty neat. Oh, is this uh, connected to the thing? Wait a second. Oh, I don't think we have sound. Anyway, okay. 
So, um, but you, so it can really help with very complex data. And this is something that I think um, uh, will be very uh, interesting to people who are dealing with, um, you know, maybe more in-depth long-form analysis of a particular event, or uh, especially in, if it's something that has to do with um, trying to make relationships between very complex things. So that's sort of one other thing. So again, there's a bunch of these tools out there, but if you think about them as, you know, how do I generate POV? How do I make m my particular POV um, live across a variety of media spaces, then maybe these are things you might want to start to think about as you search for these tools that you're looking for. Um, okay, so the other sort of piece of the value innovation pie is what I call closing the immersion loop. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is we're all, because we're all storytellers, um, we've, we've been taught that, you know, um, uh, traditional storytelling, books, films, radio, linear media um, are more immersive, okay, than ones in which their interaction occurs within them. But the reality that we've seen, and I've seen this because I've been running this laboratory for a long time and we've been focused on storytelling for so long, is that audience behaviors don't actually um, speak to that. In a weird way, participation has made that immersion a lot stronger. And so we can no, I don't, maybe in 1997 you could say, yeah, interaction is a problem with immersive um, stories uh, because it interrupts the flow and it, and it, and it changes it and, you know, it's, it's not, you're not transported in the same way. But I think it's safe to say that there's been enough examples um, over the course of the 90s and the 2000s to say that actually participation seems to have caught on with audiences so much so that um, it has become part of that immers immersive experience. Now the caveat is that participation need not occur within the cultural object itself, me meaning like we're not necessarily talking about the choose your own adventure where you, you interact specifically by choosing during, an immerse during a storytelling experience, but participation may very well occur in the development process where you're um, soliciting um, participation from audiences prior to the creation of a cultural object or a newscast or whatever, what have you. Or it might also occur after, or it might occur across. So in the, in the production value chain, participation can actually be inserted across any of those different um, activities, okay? So um, there are a number of different examples of this happening right now. Um, I'm just going to sort of, obviously there's InstaRadio, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, you know, second screen applications are examples of how participation kind of is being inserted into these broadcasts. The, the best example you guys have at the CBC was Over the Rainbow. It was an amazing thing. Um, and also, when you think about development, um, usually when people think of participation at the development process, they might think of, uh, let's say, you know, Day in the Life, which is this YouTube film um, made uh, by, I think, Ridley Scott's son, uh, or produced by Ridley Scott's son, and where they said, you know, everyone on YouTube, send us your, send us your videos of Day in the Life, and then we'll create, you know, a whole thing. But also think about, actually, spaces like Facebook as, um, as a, a sort of, not more than just focused grouping sessions, but really, Con places where you can have a conversation with your fans and audiences about what m what they might like to do and see from the shows that you're creating. This particular example was um, uh, uh, something that we accelerated. It's um, it's two writers who did once and um, um, and uh, oh god, Grimm's Grimm's fairy tales, I think. And they were being, they had joined Shaftesbury to produce a new show for Shaftesbury um, that's a teen show. And so what they did in the development of the show was they created these creative laboratories on Facebook where these writers would start to talk to their, their fan base of those TV shows about this new TV show that they were going to create. So there's those kinds of things that you can do. And again, cost effective, not too expensive. Yes, there's labor time, et cetera, but um, you know, uh, it's about thinking about thinking about how you might insert participation into your process. So this is Insta Radio, which has been since renamed Roar because Instagram has 
put a cease and desist order to anyone calling themselves Insta. So, <laughs> but um, you know, Insta Radio is essentially YouTube for radio. So it lets anyone broadcast anything. Um, it lets them uh, ag aggregate followers. Um, it categorizes all those broadcasts into different things. Um, here is their Twitter feed. Everything, everything can be then uh, posted online. The moment you broadcast something, it goes, to, it, it pings all your followers. Um, and you c they can hear the broadcast live immediately. Um, so here is, for example, Harley Morenstein, who is part of the Epic Mealtime crew of YouTube. So this was four days ago, and he posted an 8 minute and 20 second um, uh, broadcast on iPhone 6, and it got 36,245 plays and uh, a bunch of comments. So you can start to see how this integration of, um, uh, of uh, the social media feeds with some of these applications is quite powerful. So in the case of this um, Insta Radio, uh, it's really about, so what is the role of a public broadcaster in essentially allowing for a multiple po points of view to emerge from the citizen, from the civic, from civil society, you know? And so what are the tools we're going to use to allow for those points of view to bubble up? And, and as I said, what's interesting about radio is it's so much easier to get those uh, to get those very specific personalities to bubble up with audio than it is if you were to just s tell them to go off and make a whole bunch of um, YouTube, uh, YouTube videos on YouTube. So I think there's something there that's going on with um, internet audio and, and radio that's not really being mined and um, you know a public broadcaster can play a significant role in how we actually start to cultivate that. Um, and what is this? Okay, I'm not actually sure if this is part of it, too. Okay, so then, um, okay, so the, the other thing that I think is um, important in terms of this participation is um, the notion of engagement engines. So um, as you know, it's not, it's not good enough to be able to say, OK, participate with us and do what, do what have you in, in across our value chain. It's also now we're now entering a domain or a time when we actually need to understand what that participation means. And so analytics and data and understanding what that is is critical to part of what we're trying to do. And so part of these engagement engines are uh, essentially um, sort of uh, uh, specific analytical tools like, for example, um, Sprout Social, which aggregates all your social feeds and all your analytics together. I mean, tons of you probably use different types of analytic tools. <laughs> However, the other side of the engagement engine is less technological and really a lot more specific, which is like, OK, we know that we need to start talking to people and have them uh, actively engage with what we're doing, not just participate, but emotionally connect and engage. Well, YouTubers have done that by actually saying, OK, well, we're going to create a whole new channel called I Dare You. So it's all about, um, and there's a whole variety of examples of this on, on YouTube, where it's uh, the comments provide the, essentially next week's, next week's content, you know? So, these are the different dares that uh, Nega Higa has been told to do. They then have a process for, um, for triaging those dares. Um, once they triage them, then they actually end up doing them. So um, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of examples of this kind of stuff. So you can even see, and it's, and it's more than just um, send us your comments or feedback, you know? So there's a different way that YouTubers are doing this. Um, so even the unboxing videos, which unfortunately my son loves to watch. I don't know if you guys are caught in that problem as well. <laughs> but uh, like, you know, they solicit, they say, well, what do you guys want us to, sh what do you want us to show? And he's constantly saying, I want, I want eventube.hg to, to unbox, blah, blah, blah. And he really, really wants to see whether that box gets unboxed. <laughs> so there's all that kind of stuff that um, I think is uh, critical as well. So then, I think the other piece, uh, and um, I'm kind of doing a, a different play of words around here, is, is that 
One of the things I think that's important is to know that sometimes uh, value innovation occurs outside the digital space. And that, in fact, it's critical that there's a relationship between um, physical space and, uh, and digital space. So again, part of it, so this is an example of one of our, um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interactive, oops, uh oh. It's an interactive book that we were creating um, and, uh, and in order for us to determine how to create the transmedia strategy around that interactive book, so because it was a book, it was a short film, it was also a game, um, and it was something else. Uh, we ran these major events with kids and parents and gave them fake money and um, they could essentially purchase uh, different versions of the products that we were trying to create um, for this particular um, uh, property called Ramen Party. And so um, they were buying different things and with that kind of very engaging uh, live type event, uh, we determined, oh, you know what? No one was interested in purchasing the interactive app. They were more interested in purchasing the book or they were more interested in watching the movie. And so those were the things that we were going to make first. So there's a number of different ways to uh, make people feel and touch something um, that's part of a digital property creation process. Um, the other side of that is actually um, literally creating um, physical things from digital experiences. So this was uh, a recent project that we did with David Cronenberg called Body Mind Change. It was the digi digital extension to the exhibition at the Tiff Bell Lightbox. And what we did was we created um, a narrative experience um, that was predicated on this conceit that um, Cronenberg licensed all the IP to his films to a biotech company. Mm -hmm. And so the first product that we were going to create was this recommendation biological creature called Pod. And we, we had a call for, particip for beta testers. And so um, if you said yes, then you go online, you, you participated in this episodic narrative experience. Um, which asked you questions, but also showed you some some stories, um, and and it was there were games, etc. And then whatever you your, the data that we were collecting from you online was customizing a personal pod for you, which you then could visit at the Tiff Bell Lightbox third floor installation room where we could set up a pretend biotech library laboratory. So um, this piece actually generated a physical object. Mm -hmm. So that was very, very interesting because we found that the engagement rates were off the chart. And I think it was because people loved the idea that they were going to come away with an object at the end of the experience. And so they were not going to leave the experience halfway through because then that would mean that they won't get their pod. So that's kind of an interesting uh, model. But in terms of, um, in terms of like, you know, uh, that was a bit expensive, so you might not want to do that. But in terms of, uh, oh, in terms of what that means in term, uh, as a toolkit, it's really this notion of, okay, what are, what are the live mechanisms that I'm going to attach to, this per to, to these particular properties that I'm creating? And um, live doesn't necessarily, so yes, live means live as an in person, but live could also mean live as in real time. So some of the things, I mean, I, 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 I sort of backtrack there because I did say it's important to kind of marry the physical to the digital, but forgive me for that slight change in my, <laughs> in my uh, sort of, uh, to, n that I'm not so, so precise there. But I do think that real-time applications have, have the same quality as live. So if you can't afford to do a, a full-blown live event, well, then at the very least, what are some of the kinds of um, real-time uh, things you can attach to, uh, to your property? So this side notes by Live Fire is quite interesting. So here, it's really around this notion of um, um, footnotes. So when I first started, uh, uh, per, you know, when I first started in the space of interactive storytelling, the thing that we talked about a lot was all of a sudden marginalia would come to life. You know, like that's so cool. Like the center does not hold, et cetera. Anyway, but it, it wasn't until now that you have these real-time side notes or footnotes that that actually has become a reality. So this is a way for you to create these kind of um, news uh, events. Bef we're so used to seeing them after 
But if you attach them together, again, space is very important, right? So the context, where you place two things together, changes everything on how we read things and how we understand them. Um, and then, obviously, like the whole meetup thing is a pretty specific thing, you know? So there are a number of different ways that you can use already existing um, um, uh, uh, you know, live aggregation tools online to actually develop your own, um, to, to develop your own live events, again, for, for not as much money as you might think. Um, and then I think this, this idea of uh, uh, if, if the physical and the um, digital need to play together, the other thing that needs to play together is, and I think this is the, probably the newest thing um, around value innovation, is I do think we s need to start figuring out how to think about content spatially and how to think about how it lives between things, okay? Because we're moving into an environment where um, computational power isn't just on computers or on, on our mobile phones, but it's on everything. So your watch, your, your, your storytelling tile, your, um, you know, your Google Glass. So this is a, a we just, we developed a, a wearable accelerator last year where we, where we made a bunch of Google Glass applications. Um, Google Glass is actually quite interesting for events and news because it's a notification system really more than anything else. So it's about providing that layer of context um, on top of the real world. So that has major ramifications for news and for events and for, and audio is also big. So I would, I would er encourage you to play around with it. Um, obviously, Oculus Rift is a, like a massive um, game changer. You know, this, was, uh, this is a head-mounted display um, bought by Facebook for $2 billion, if you don't know about this yet. It's going to go, um, uh, it's going to be distributed to consumers next year. And, you know, they're saying that it's going to be over a million units sold. You know, it's going to be sold like the iPhone 6. I mean, they have so much money. It's that this is going to be the next big thing that's going to happen. So it's this notion of, okay, how do we start thinking about content and space? And um, I just threw that in because I've always loved this art piece. <laughs> so this is a, a piece by an art collective, Gelatin. And, um, and it's about putting stuff in places that you don't think they match. And, so in terms of a toolkit item, it's really about you just need to, I don't know what they are, but you're going to need to start playing around with wearables somehow, you know, because, because it's a different way of thinking about stories and content and how it migrates from one to another. Um, and that's the next big thing that's going to happen. So, and, it, and it's a continuum between augmented reality, which are the Google glasses, so things that are overlaid on top of the real world, all the way to things replacing the real world through virtual reality. And so those two spaces are a very different, and it's quite different from the 2D environments that we've been used to. So it's, um, it's something that we need to pay attention to. And then lastly, it's really around this notion of being able to fail faster. And so one of the things that I think is critical as part of this, um, as part of what we need to do is the, the ability to create a culture of experimentation and of, not, uh, of allowing for these experiments to be not so fancy. You know, like let's just do something small and that's not, that's not quite fixed yet or might not have all the bells and whistles, but let's get it out there and, 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 and share it with our audience. And you have certain things like um, hit record, um, you know, uh, where uh, their, that's their business model. It's like, let's bring a bunch of things together. Let's work on it. We don't know what it's going to be. Is it, a, is it, a, is it music? Is it video? Is it, is it you know, text? Let's keep talking to people about what we're making. And then they'll spit out a product. And their products are like a book with a CD in it and uh, you know, something. They're odd products. So, um, so I think that in terms of a toolkit, what we really need are nimble media creators or things that will keep us um, nimble. And the, the last thing that I just want to share is, um, so here's a, I, how many of you guys saw this? The Gifferator? Mm -hmm. So, oh, you did? Okay. 
So this was so this is interesting because this was probably uh, well it's being touted as the meme of 2014, um, and uh, uh, and this is where EA Sports actually developed um, an automatic GIF creator that they then um, uh, sent to all their audiences to then create any GIFs they wanted of any football player with the with the with the um, uh, text on top of it. And so tons and tons of people submitted a variety of these um, GIFs or GIFs or however you want to call it. Um, but the point I was making in, in using this as a case is that you could actually make anyone create GIFs. Like it's easy to create GIFs. People who are on Tumblr can make their own GIFs and they do that a lot. But by owning the Giferator, what EA did was they then owned that entire um, social uh, um, uh, sort of virality associated with a successful campaign. So, um, so sometimes, uh, you know, you can use the tools that I talked about, but other times it might actually be more important to create your own tool because then you have control over what gets disseminated out of there. And in order for you to create your own tool, you need to be okay with creating a tool that's not fantastic. And so what's cool about the EA Sports thing is that it's such a simple tool. It actually didn't require a lot of coding or anything, but they knew right away that by creating their own tool and then disseminating themselves um, that, that they would win. So those are my, uh, I think, six um, tools in my kit. For the Insta Radio, because it's a broadcasting tool, you can you, whatever you broadcast is your own, um, and they have not yet got. So they have uh, broadcasters who will go to shows and then broadcast the entire show, um, but as of yet, they have not been told to take down the the stream. So I think part of it is there's still this gray area between. Um, you know, because the broadcast streams are not being monetized, then it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's like your notes that you're just sharing with a bunch of people. So, um, in the so I would say that if CBC Radio were to use Insta Radio, obviously you would have to make sure that everything you're broadcasting through it is, is, light, is uh, you know, rights, um, uh, rights free or, or you own the rights to it. But for the people who are using it to broadcast their own things, um, they're, they're not concerned about that at all. Well, I think it depends on whether or not what you want to do is, so let's say what I might do is embed the, the broadcasts from Roar on your website, but encourage a whole variety of people to use Roar to create their own particular broadcast that you would then aggregate and put onto CBC. So it's a tool for creation as well as it is a tool for dissemination or distribution. Well, the, the, I think the important thing was that EA could create that generator quickly. And so part of it too is about creating a culture where you can create these tools very, very quickly. You know, and you're not, and, and it's not about having so many different levels of bureaucracy saying, no, you can't do that, or, you know, you have to do a, a ISO quality assurance before you, you, you spit out that tool. So it's, a, it's, it's my point around that was this notion of, um, yes, we can create content within the CBC, but how easily can we create platforms or how easily can we create tools that we can then quickly disseminate to the public for use, you know? So it's more around that. And um, as, let's say, uh, you bring in talent um, who are digital natives, who are more, who are more uh, numerate and able to code and things like that, and as the tools themselves get easier to use, uh, there may very well be a ton of people here in this audience who could actually create really simple scripts that then become you know, these kinds of things that you would disseminate on your website, et cetera. Well, I think it will because um, if, I mean, there's a reason why Facebook bought Oculus. So they definitely feel like that the social space is going to be a full body space where, um, you know, 
where people will hang together or and or if people are playing games there's a way for the social space to infiltrate that you know whether it's like pausing the game and like it's like let's all sing uh you know happy birthday to tanya it's your birthday today and then everyone just sings happy birthday and you're all still in that space so if for example news or events or any kind of long form storytelling content refuses to go into that space then basically people will hang there forever and ever and ever and never actually see a news feed. It may seem like it's far away, but it's actually not as far away as we think. Or um, And so experimenting with how you would actually tell the news. So a, a, a one thing that we were, for example, thinking about is, um, so we're doing a bunch of uh, Rift experience, uh, a Rift lab, you know, an Oculus Rift lab to try to um, experiment with a different variety of forms. So one of the things we're looking at is um, the Wanted 18 was this documentary that did well in, in um, a TIFF and so Ina Fitchman and I were talking and she said I want to f figure out a way to use the Oculus with that and so uh, at first the obvious thing was to walk around maybe that area of Palestine where the cows were living and do some kind of interesting animated thing with it. But then I thought you know what I'd love to know what a talking head interview looks like on a rift. I know that sounds weird because it might seem boring, but then if we're, but sometimes it might actually be interesting to take super banal things that we're all so used to, but then slightly explore how that they would change with the introduction of space and, um, you know, the ability to introduce. 3D green screened elements into the actual conversation. So can can a documentarian talking about their process do so in the same way that a weather person might talk about the weather within a space? And so how does that change the nature of the interview? How does that change um, those kinds of, so those are the types of things we're experimenting with in terms of um, how do we push uh, you know, 3D virtual reality experience um, further, it doesn't have to be, again, super immersive stuff. It could be as simple as, if I could show you how to, you know, what the, what the Ebola virus looks like and how the hook works by doing this, and I'm seeing that on an Oculus Rift, will it be more powerful? I don't know. Um, I wouldn't actually put them all into an integrated whole, but it's really about um, being able to find pieces of that where people go. Okay, so for example, um, if you have, so How Stuff Works, I was just listening to the podcast the other day, uh, you know, the How Stuff Works podcast, and then the, their video of that is very different than their podcast they have an infographic associated with what they're talking about that lives on their website. So these are, and then they might tweet that out, so then you see the tweet of the infographic, but then you, you look at it and you go, wow, that's kind of interesting, and then they tell you that, oh, but the, we have a podcast just about this very issue, so then you listen to that, which adds more context to what you've just seen in terms of the visual. So it's not about putting everything together, but it's knowing that people go to different channels online and that the more you can provide um, uh, you know, content, I don't like to use content because most of it is bad, so the more you can provide a point of view um, in these spaces, um, then I think the more, uh, the, the, it's almost like you're covering all your basis in terms of all the learning styles and how people actually uh, learn about stuff. And the, and the thing that I'm interested in is um, how do we do that so it's not, you don't need like 50 people to do all that stuff for you, right? So it's about what is that next generation, uh, let's say newscaster, okay? So that next generation journalist um, who, who has enough knowledge of all the tools to actually be able to create really meaningful pieces of content but in diff but but formatted in different ways um, quickly, you know. So I I think that's where the power of this stuff could really lie in terms of how do we how do we arm people with some of these tools to help them be able to contextualize information that easily um, 
in a timely fashion at the point at which they want to do something because at the end of the day it's their voice that's the most important that and that will that's the thing that's going to rise above in the top of course you'll have the fancy stuff that people will look at but it's amazing how much if it's the right information delivered in the right way at the right time it will it will generate value and, and, and interest. Like if you look at BuzzFeed, I mean their stuff suck, looks terrible, right? Like you're, you're talking about very, very 1997 looking things. Um, but what they've, what they've figured out is that people love to know about themselves. So everything is about I, you know, everything is about um, I want to know what, like their crazy BuzzFeed quiz generator thing that they made, it's all about what word am I? I did that test. Yes, it's true. Like it's, you know, but so how do we create the same type of instantaneous connection, but with real content? Well, I mean, I actually think that we need to deregulate the entire broadcast system. And I think that um, because it's, we're, it's a losing battle, but we can. Did you just sign that? Yeah. yeah. Is that a sign with class? But, 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 the big caveat is that if you're going to do that, then you need to like pour in a ton of money to the CBC, the NFB, and the CFC. That's because you because those are the you know um, those are the the then 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 there's we have a chance of creating something that's more akin to what's happened what happened in England um, and places like that where you've got support for for innovation in these large cultural institutions and that becomes the core proposition for why we're existing you know but being this kind of like yes we're culture but also we're commercial and it's 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 terror it's not a good space to be right now specifically yeah it's about creating the structures for participation so you really as a as a creator you really need to understand how you're designing these um, openings and what are the what are when i say openings like when you invite someone in what's the what are the frameworks around that invitation? What are you asking them? What are they supposed to do? What can they do? What are the ethical guidelines around that? So there's a bunch of design stuff that you need to do when you open, like, and the YouTubers even, they, they, they're also quite specific. The ones who just says, give us your comments, they very quickly realize that the, that the flame, that, that a flame war will erupt, right? So then they, the next episode, they'll go, okay, give us your comments, but, Make sure you do, and so they, they design these things very well. It's, it's almost like, it's similar to designing a game, where you're t giving a bunch of rules around how you're supposed to play that game, and there's, a, there's very specific sets of things that people understand what their roles are. So it's really important that the audience members know what their roles are in that, part, in that participatory exchange. Well, I think what you're doing is unique enough for the next little while, I would say. It's just that what, what hap the reason why I talked about value innovation in the content space is because it really is about this, there's only so much time. Now, the good news for radio, here's the interesting, is that people do ra listen to radio while they're doing something else. So that's the good news, because in a weird way, you're, you, you're not necessarily competing for that for that space between not working and then and then going home to cook dinner, you know? So then people will go, okay, do I play a game or do I watch that episode of whatever, House of Courts, et cetera. So there, that's in your favor. However, it will continue to, where you might actually get um, some competition from is um, when uh, the devices start talking to people. Like I actually think that that's something we haven't thought of. So as you're, as you're, a, as you're wearing, you know, your Google Glass, like the voice in the Google Glass isn't so great, but there it's getting there. And um, uh, certainly, you know, with the Fitbits and things like that, they're attached to your iPhones, and so there's they're going to start to encroach upon some of the audio-related uh, uh, 
content that's being created. So you can just imagine you not only are you doing the Fitbit, but you're also uh, in running, let's say, but then right after your run, you might have, they might extend that to create a podcast, to create some kind of audio um, experience, meditative, where they talk about how well you might have run and how do you know, like God knows what, right? So you're, there might be a way to compete. There's this amazing app that's called um, the Early Edition, and it's done by Capsule.f. Have you seen it? Okay. So what it is, it's um, it's it's uh, it's it's her. You know that movie by Spike Jones. It's basically the the first the first iteration of her, where they've taken they've allowed you to customize your um, wake up call by choosing which feeds you want read, what type of song, and the tone the tonal quality. And then they've developed these um, AI voices that are quite compelling. And so they will wait, you know, you can choose, for, I think, from Monica and Steve. And so it'll be like, it's time to wake up now. And uh, Google stock price just went down to whatever. And it's very, very compelling. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also another com um, potential competitor in the space. It can also automatically put on the CDC, though. It can, it can, it's true, it can, it can, yeah. But it's this notion that, you know, technologists aren't that dumb, right? Like they start, they realize that this sort of personalization, like the fact that her was about the voice is, a, is I think, one of the first indications that that's what a lot of people are going to concentrate on. So if, you, if radio were to start competing with an AI agent who reads out the New York Times, that's a problem. Yeah. And if that AI agent's voice is that, you know, honeyed and whatever is Scarlett Johansson. Who knows? Maybe Scarlett Johansson will say, yeah, I'll read all the words and then you can just throw them together. <laughs> I think it's the, P I mean, I think it's this POV. I think that's what's been missing in a lot of content online, um, video based. And well, that you have POV on YouTube, but it's not the kind of POV I'm interested in. So I think it's the fact that it can be smart it can be personal, and you can do it at the same time as you're doing other things. And so if I can figure out a way to add that to other, th to other rich media experiences that I'm experiencing, it might be kind of cool.